Um, so I, I wanted to start. Everyone should be mic'd up here, right? Okay. Excuse me. Yes. <laughs> you move, everyone here is right. Um, so by the way, thank you for the really interesting set of remarks. Um, I wanted to, again, go back to one of the points that Jay made in his talk about innovation and great jobs. And really, if you think uh, beyond kind of the rise from being poor countries to becoming middle-income countries, but really going beyond that and becoming global players at a higher level of development, um, in the areas of the world that you are familiar with, what do you view as the potential for achieving real innovation uh, in, in these areas? Um, and is this what emerging markets should be focusing on now? Or is that still kind of something out in the future? Uh, so um, maybe we can take it in the order of the speakers. So sure, Leon, if you sure. want to just comment. I think it's a mixture. Because when you look at the um, uh, sort of more traditional emerging market economies, uh, it's a largely, you know, imitation which is not wrong, there's nothing wrong about it. It's just a way to move ahead very fast. And they've been very successful at it, those that have moved ahead and so on. And there have been innovations partially grafted on in the local context um, by sort of adopting the most advanced or more advanced uh, technologies and techniques and then innovating them in the, in the context. Now what you increasingly see, especially with the foreign direct investment, is that you will have uh, now uh, uh, more and more innovation going on in the various economies. It still is concentrated. You still have incredible economies of scale in uh, innovation uh, and inventive type uh, capacities. So the multinationals still will have you know, one, two, or three, not uh, 60 sort of innovation centers around the world. Uh, but you will see some of them located now, especially in the large emerging markets, uh, India, China, Brazil, and so on. Uh, there is, by the way, a lot of competition between Europe and the U.S. in that respect. And we saw in the figure in terms of GDP, the U.S. is you know, quite, uh, quite strong in terms of allocating a large part of GDP for it. So I would say it's a mixture, and it's perfectly fine. And I would expect that to continue actually going forward. And obviously, as these countries are moving ahead, it'll be more of the true innovation as opposed to the adopt, increased adoption and adoption of uh, advanced country technologies. Yeah. Uh, I can only speak from uh, the point of view of China. Um, China is a huge country. So in this case, I think China can walk on two legs. Uh, on the uh, industrial level, China can still move slowly, uh, step by step, uh, adopting technologies from Western countries. Uh, uh, this is still a huge gap over there, so uh, you know, China can do a lot. On the other hand, uh, China has accumulated so much human capital in R&D, uh, especially in universities and uh, in those research institutes, CAS. Uh, the Chinese government can spend more money into those uh, research institutes and then China can catch up uh, relatively faster uh, than other countries. But I, I want to add that probably the emphasis on innovation is uh, premature, probably for countries like uh, China and India. Why do we want to become kind of as innovative as the United States? Actually, not a single country can compete with the United States in terms of innovation. Right? Uh, as long as we can improve human capital, uh, it's good. We can improve our productivity, okay, and they improve the quality of life. Uh, uh, think about the, those uh, workers uh, uh, working for us to do internal innovation. Uh, in the, uh, I'm sorry, decoration. Right? It's uh, when we buy our apartments, it's just to bear walls. Uh, when those workers uh, do things, uh, they leave a lot of uh, problems to your houses. Okay, like a leaking uh, faucet uh, everywhere, you have to redo this. Uh, education will improve that. Uh, I mean, you may not increase your GDP, but uh, improve your life quality quite a lot. Right? So we, you don't forget that, that kind of improvement in your country. Albert, I have a slightly different take on this. Uh, first, I believe that for countries to become industrialized in the sense that North America did or Western Europe did. 
you must have the capacity to move from importation, absorption and adaptation of technology to innovation, at least in one, two or a few sectors of the economy. The Belgians do not innovate in everything, the Swiss do not, but somewhere you have to have that capacity. Now, if I look at the experience of emerging economies in the past 30 years, there are two that have clearly arrived. I think the Republic of Korea and possibly Taiwan. China, India and Brazil are candidates with the potential but have not yet arrived. Each of the three of them, and this has nothing to do with the past 30 years in markets and liberalization, began life in their pursuit of development by establishing a capital goods sector, all three of them. And everybody said the costs of learning to industrialize were too high. Uh, but benefits have accrued after a time lag. Now, if we look at these three countries, uh, you would find that Brazil has developed the Embraer aircraft. Right? You would find that Brazil is now a leader in offshore exploration technologies. It leads the majors. Uh, China has very sophisticated defense research, uh, deep sea matters. Uh, India is a leader in inf information technology, satellites in space. But these are, you know, one swallow does not make a summer and one drop of rain does not make a monsoon. Uh, I think that these three countries perhaps more than anybody else, have the capacity to reach that next stage in innovation. But it will not happen by accident. It will not happen by relying on markets alone. We know from the experience of Europe, say, they would never have had an Airbus industry had it not been for strategic intervention. So there has to be some strategic technology policy that develops technological capabilities uh, at a major level in firms and in the economy at a macro level. Because, you know, if firms have the option of importing technology at any point in time, uh, they are much like the schoolboy who never learns, who can get someone else to write the exams for him. So there has to be some conscious effort. But you did ask another question, and I'll give a one-line answer. Uh, you know, I think it is essential if economic growth is to transform into meaningful development that improves the well-being of people, it must be associated with employment creation. And the only success story in emerging economies outside Korea and Taiwan is China. Because the process of growth, however unequal between people and regions, has created employment. This is not happening in India. This is not happening in Brazil. Uh, this is not happening in any of the other emerging economies that you can think of. Economic inequalities are growing. And I believe that we must change our paradigm. We all think too much in terms of, of wages as costs on the supply side, but wages are incomes on the demand side that can drive growth uh, and that can make innovation possibilities materialize. And what sets apart China is really its success in manufacturing Absolutely. in terms of uh, creating employment. Um, let me um, ask another question. It struck me when, when uh, the three, three of you were talking about how emerging economies are responding to the challenge of global crisis, global slowdown. I think the emphasis was a bit different in some respects. Uh, Deepak, you were saying that we should be careful in financial liberalization. This is a lesson. Um, Jan was saying, let's explore more globalization, but with other emerging mm -hmm. markets, in, at least in trade or diversifying exports, as in the Turkish case. And one thing that concerns me about the, less, the, the, the advice to kind of don't, be, don't let yourself be vulnerable to the global market is that, you know, in, in Hong Kong in particular, there's a lot of desire for China to liberalize its capital account aggressively and to become more globally integrated financially and this, this will promote. So if the response to glo the global crisis is that, hey, the rest of the world is not reliable, we have to become more internal, does that really put us in a position to take full advantage of growth opportunities once the world recovers? And is this a temporary kind of set of advice that we should just do this while the rest of the world is so? Or is this a structural kind of set of um, uh, advice that is saying, see what happened when you didn't do it the right way and that 
you know, we should do it a different way. So I'll just throw that out there. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I think, uh, so the first, first thing to realize is it's a question of how much risk or fluctuation, uncertainty, are you willing to tolerate and take, right? So liberalization of capital markets, I think people's view on that hinges in part on that. If you're totally uh, risk neutral and you don't mind the roller coaster, then, yeah, there are great benefits from the capital flows coming in. Of course, you know, they can go out overnight and so on and so forth. But, yes, uh, countries that had very little foreign capital before will have more as a result, but together with the gyrations, right? So I think given especially the financial crisis, which came from the most advanced capital market that was assumed to be efficient and, you know, not much wrong could happen, I think the more and more people are, are willing to accept some uh, capital account regulation as being reasonable precisely to reduce the uh, magnitude of the, uh, the amplitude of, 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 the, of the fluctuations. And I think similarly for, for individual countries. Uh, it's very difficult to hedge and some, for instance, uh, the Central East European countries have joined the Euro even though they realize it's a project which is fraught with difficulties precisely because they can eliminate the exchange rate risk. So take two countries, Czech Republic and Slovakia. Slovakia joined, even though it's slightly less developed than the Czech Republic and the Czechs have not. Nowadays with FDI, you see very often that the investors will come in, they look at the two countries, and will opt for Slovakia simply because they avoid the 30% fluctuation of the local currency vis-a-vis -vis the euro that can happen easily within six months in either direction. Right? So, uh, so uh, in some sense, you know, the question is your attitude toward, towards that. And I think that, uh, you know, I would also go probably for some, uh, you know, increasing regulation, but reasonable one, obviously. I wouldn't go completely to the period when we had, uh, you know, no capital, no capital flows or completely uh, controlled things, because I think that uh, the uh, several decades, despite the crises, have shown that actually the situation is much better. Now, what I was stressing in my uh, points was more the trade benefits. I think the trade benefits, free trade benefits, I think, are substantial. Again, there are displacements and so on and so forth, so the adjustment costs are there. But I think many, many countries have now learned how to have trade adjustment assistance, how to help move workers and so on, so that there, uh, the, uh, you know, and how to have protective temporary tariffs or other measures and so on and so forth. Uh, and you can do that more easily than with capital. Capital just moves very fast. Uh, and I'm not speaking just about the um, portfolio. That one is known and people talk about it and there is the discussion should there be some tax on, on portfolio transactions. I've seen very rapid movements of foreign direct investments where companies really unscrewed the equipment and moved it from France to Slovakia, let's say, you know, overnight, almost literally. Uh, so even that can happen. Uh, I think in the Chinese case, uh, uh, capital account liberalization will be a forced one. Uh, China really wants to get its currency to become a international currency. And in the meantime, use Hong Kong as kind of offshore market for RMB transaction. But you can do that uh, forever, right? Uh, people need uh, flexibility to uh, convert uh, RMB back uh, into other currencies and also to send the money back uh, into China. Uh, so the firewall cannot be there forever. Uh, so uh, in, in that case, I think uh, the government uh, is wise to announce kind of a plan to get rid of uh, the capital account uh, 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 control. I, I don't know if there is a timetable, but definitely that's the goal of this uh, current government. Um, you know, I think it is important to recognize that there is a genuine difference of opinion. Uh, there are people like me who believe that we must be prudent in deregulation of domestic financial sectors. And that has to do with the distinction between banking and non-banking financial intermediaries. That lesson is clear. And two, that we should hasten slowly with capital account liberalization. Right? Uh, China and, and Brazil, uh, Brazil and India have been very skillful in this. There is capital account liberalization for all foreigners and non-residents, uh, but there's not enough capital liberalization for citizens and residents. It's asymmetrical. They have not dollarized their economies. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it makes sense to, to, to 
move in a prudent, gradual manner. I think the Republic of Korea has arrived. It can afford capital account liberalization. And we must not forget history. Uh, please remember that the United States introduced capital account liberalization in Switzerland in 1973. Uh, France introduced current convertibility on capital account in 1989. Uh, Japan slightly later. These countries took a period of five decades to move from current account liberalization to capital account liberalization. What we are attempting to do in the emerging economies is to put it on fast forward. Uh, I think it's neither necessary nor desirable. And, you know, Jan's point I agree with, that there are benefits to be derived from openness in trade, in foreign direct investment. Uh, and in that, all evidence suggests that emerging economies and the developing world are both engaging more and more with the world economy. And that openness will remain. The only thing that worries me is that if we should not move away from a multilateral trading system, uh, which has non-discrimination built into F MFN and, and the WTO as an institution, to trading blocks, to free trade agreements, because they are not building blocks. They are stumbling blocks to an open and multilateral trading system. I'm going to ask one more question, then we'll open up to uh, questions from the floor. Um, I'm curious if we're making a mistake of always talking about emerging markets as a group. Okay. You pointed out, Deepak, that there are a lot of differences. Um, but more generally, to what extent do the main emerging markets, should, should they think of each other as partners, complementarity, uh, or should they think of each other as competitors? And are their interests really aligned in terms of the objectives that they're seeking for their, their own economies? So I was wondering what's your thought thoughts are on, on this issue about competitors versus partners in development emerging markets. Yeah, well, so I addressed it a little bit on one yeah. of my slides where I was saying in trying to develop uh, institutions that are beneficial globally, be it the uh, totally free trade or, you know, open, open trading system as opposed to bilateral, I think they have very much common interests, right? Similarly to have some kind of global economic governance that, for instance, will uh, prevent uh, or reduce the probability of uh, future major financial crises, again, you know, they have the same, same interest there. And, and I think then, you know, as in everything else, they also have an interest in having a level playing field for competition, and, but they obviously will be competing like everybody else for markets and for technologies and for everything else. And there I think that's the basis of the system that uh, we've selected in the end to have after the experimentation of the last century. And, and I think there, I think most of them would be in agreement with that as well. Okay. Uh, uh, of course, uh, there, are, there is some competition over there because uh, we export the uh, same type of uh, products. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, I think we have more complementarity uh, first, uh, like Yang just uh, pointed out, uh, in the India, China, and other BRICS countries uh, have a common interest to reform the current uh, world financial uh, uh, architecture, like IMF, right? So we share the same goals. And we sh share the same goal in the uh, trade talks. Right? Free trade is going to help uh, probably the emerging markets more than developed countries, uh, at least uh, at this stage. Uh, even in terms of uh, the, the, the export side, uh, if we look at data, China runs uh, surplus only with actually one country, that's the United States. China runs deficits uh, with the rest of the world as a whole, which means that China is creating demand for the rest of the world. If we look at uh, Asia, that's uh, even more so. Uh, not, uh, uh, and also those resource exporting countries, right? So in, in that case, uh, China is becoming is kind of a gross uh, driver for the rest of the world. Probably not through imports of consumer goods, but through imports of those intermediate goods. Um, I think emerging countries are partners in one sense, competitors in the other. Uh, Partners, for sure, in the longer term. Competitors in the shorter term. 
But on the whole, uh, I think partnership is much more important than competition. Uh, widen the canvas. Think not just of emerging economies, what they do to each other, but what they are doing for the developing world as a whole, Latin America, Africa, Asia. Now, the first thing that growth in emerging economies has done for the developing world is that it has improved terms of trade. Uh, the demand from China and India and Brazil for primary commodities, given low levels of per capita consumption, high income elasticities of demand, has driven up prices of primary commodities. Uh, at the same time, the availability of labor intensive manufactured consumer goods, what we might call wage goods or necessities, from these emerging economies at lower prices, taken together, have improved the terms of trade for emerging economies as buyers in the world market and for the developing world as a whole. Two, they have created, uh, their rapid economic growth has created an expansion in world markets for exports, both of primary commodities and of manufacturers from the developing world. In other words, uh, there are complementarities on the demand side because these, these countries are providing external markets. Mm -hmm. uh, third, they are already becoming, if you look at evidence, you know, international investment by firms from developing countries, you know, Korea, China, India, and Brazil, is becoming an increasingly important source of external finance. So they are providing external resources. And I hope that if they follow the innovation track, that they could become an alternative source of more appropriate technologies for the developing world. So on the whole, I see partnership mm -hmm. is much more important. There is rivalry. In the short run, uh, they are competing uh, for markets for their exports. Mm -hmm. uh, in the short run, they are competing as destinations for investment that comes from the industrialized countries. But if we were to shift the focus just a little away from Asia and Latin America, which we tend to do, if you're in Africa, then you worry about the long-term implications much more. Because, you know, Korea, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore vacated their space in the international trade matrix and moved on as real wages rose. But China and India are less likely to in the shorter run. And what this means for industrialization in Africa or industrial prospects in Africa is something uh, that is a cause for concern. So people who study Africa are worrying about what it might mean for industrialization. But in sum, I would still say uh, the benefits of partnership are much greater than any possible costs of competition. Okay. Can I add on the Africa? Uh, if you look at the historical data, when Taiwan and Hong Kong, Macau capital, uh, went to mainland China, that was uh, the middle of the 1980s. Mm -hmm. uh, quickly, I think that there will be a wave of uh, outbound investment from China to Africa. That's actually happening. So uh, originally, I actually had the same idea as you had. Oh, what about, what, what about uh, Africa? Can Africa have uh, industrialization in China or in India? Probably not, but uh, now I have changed my mind. You know, uh, China and the, probably also India will quickly will move a lot of industry to in, uh, to, to Africa, right? Yeah. Those uh, were labor intensive, low cost uh, uh, jobs were shipped from China to Africa very, very quickly in the next 20 years, uh, 10 years, 20 years. That's happening, but the happening. jury is still out on that. It's not clear how it'll unfold yet. Um, thank you very much. Uh, let me open the, with some questions. Uh, Edwin and then Jong. Uh, I'm concerned about the lack of progress in the Doha round of the WTO uh, negotiation. I think, I think uh, further progress in the WTO negotiation would be very important to uh, world growth at this juncture, especially for emerging markets, in my opinion. Uh, and there seems to be a lot of room for for improvement, for example, the service sector uh, liberalization uh, has been on the agenda for a long time, and it seems to be stalled. And uh, I'm very concerned about that. And uh, I, I'd like to know uh, what are the views of 
of you guys uh, uh, about this? Any takers? Yeah. No, I'll, I'll be glad to start. I, I, I am also very, very upset about it. I think that it's, surprisingly, it's been surprisingly difficult to get this round concluded. It's been languishing for a long time. I happen to have a, a colleague and friend, Jagdish Bhagwati, who is actually working uh, you know, on that part of the Bhagwati Sutherland Commission, trying to, to get it moving, and uh, and they've been um, you know quite uh, unhappy with it that uh, there are just uh, particular interests that seem to be blocking uh, the progress. So the goal is now maybe to uh, get a few issues. It's the Bali Initiative, as it's being called, that perhaps you know enough countries could agree on, and you could conclude the round, and then you know move on. But, uh, but frankly, I would say a large part of the economics profession is already thinking that uh, this, may not, this may not materialize. And in the meantime, the problem is that these bilateral treaties are proliferating in a major way, as uh, he was showing. And, um, and you know, they are not a substitute. Uh, they are, you know, many of them and regionally and so on happened. And maybe they'll start approximating something more global. But it's not an efficient way to go about it. And it creates all sorts of exceptions and diversions and so on and so forth, so it's, it's unfortunate. So this is an interesting thing because I think everybody involved understands the benefits, so it's not like there is a misunderstanding, but there are enough particular interests uh, that are willing to block or don't feel that it's important to proceed. Uh, I think this is a very important question, uh, but we have to recognize the reality. The Doha round is dead, in my view, and the next round of multilateral trade negotiations may not begin for some time. Uh, if you look at the principal players in this game, at, at one end and at the other, you will see the reason for my pessimism. In the United States, uh, President Obama, even in his second term, uh, given the slow recovery, is not terribly interested given his political constituencies and the prospects of the economy in trade liberalization. And there is no fast track authority from the United States Congress for the USTR to negotiate. That means no progress. The EU uh, is in deep crisis. Uh, and this is not the short term. This is a structural crisis where a relative decline seems to have become in, in productivity growth, in technical progress. And they're very reluctant. At the other end, you have a few major players. The emerging economies are keen on trade liberalization. It's in their interest. Okay? But a large number of the least developed countries are very worried because it promises deindustrialization from them, for them, some of them. Uh, and for that reason, it's not just that the Doha round is dead, but the next round may not begin for some, some time. Now, I think this is dangerous, and Jan and I may differ on some things, but we agree on this. Because a multilateral trading system, a system of rules, is necessary and desirable in the interests of the poor and the weak. Uh, the strong and the rich can get away in a world without rules, but the poor and the weak can't. We need them. And these uh, sort of plurilateral, bilateral, regional arrangements which are proliferating are dangerous for a multilateral trading system. And the European Union quietly is pushing for the economic partnerships agreements in Africa, which have become a major source of concern for Africa. Now, I have an answer. I think that if the WTO stops being an overloaded elevator, everybody and their grandmother want to put every issue, labor standards, environment, intellectual property. So the, the range of conflict has become very wide we would be much smarter to go back in the WTO to the core issues of international trade and set rules for the multilateral trading system, uh, leave the rest to other organizations, the ILO, the WIPO. Uh, and if we were able to narrow the agenda of the WTO, I think we could get progress in a multilateral round. Okay. Um, so I guess it is not difficult to write down a laundry list of problems that major emerging econ economies face it now. But my question is, what in your view are the key, if I just push you uh, to point out one key binding constraint that China or India or, or Brazil or, Zach or, or Turkey 
faces in the next five to 10 years, what would you say? Uh, let me add that by key binding constraint, what, what's in my mind is that you know, this constraint might be there for a while. Why they do not, why they are, they, they are not the bottleneck for the growth in the past 10 years, but now they might be the key bottleneck for the growth in the next five to 10 years. Thank you. Well, you know, it's, it's not easy <clears throat> to say. I mean, part of the emerging markets are uh, emerging from or distinguished from the other economies because they have been very successful. So they've managed over the last decade, two or three decades, in case of China, four decades, uh, to really overcome, in a way, uh, what were the obstacles that people were always thinking were going to hit them and prevent them from, from running. I am worried, I guess, right now the most about the financial sector and capital constraints, credit constraints that are there and may become even more uh, extreme. And that's why I spent a little bit of my discussion on, you know, can there be alternative sources, domestic or otherwise? And again, these economies are the ones that most likely will find a way because they are dynamic, they do have alternatives. But, uh, but I think that if I were to say what's the one constraint, I would probably think that this would be the one that will appear to be the most binding. Uh, in the case of China, I really don't think that there is a binding constraint for China in the next five years or, or even 10 years. But beyond that, I would just say uh, the sort of unequal distribution of the human capital and the significant role of the state can become a binding constraint. In the case of India, I think in the medium term, uh, I would not call it a binding constraint, uh, but it is a dominant constraint. Uh, we need to create employment in the process of economic growth. It will not just reduce poverty and prevent inequality from rising as much as it otherwise would. It would also sustain growth. And in the long term, binding constraints. We have to get our act together in India on education, and on infrastructure. Uh, if we don't do that, huh, if we don't act here and now, the outcome will be visible 10 years from now. But if we don't do that, uh, I think we've had it. You know, all this promise uh, will not materialize. But just to continue and push it a little bit, wouldn't that in the end boil down to again having the capital for the huge infrastructure projects and, and you know, all that? I don't think young capital is any longer a dominant constraint. You know, India is saving 35% of its GDP. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, those savings rates are going to rise. The trouble is our savings have not been mobilized for investment, and when they have been, that investment has not yielded rates of return. So we are spending a lot of public resource on, on poor delivery of public services uh, and in transfer payments. Now, if only we were to use some of that to create an infrastructure in rural India, uh, it could work wonders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't think capital is the dominant constraint. So in some sense, in your case, it's a domestic constraint of allocating resources. It's the efficiency enhancing. Yeah, it's the difference between outlays and outcomes. We kind yeah. of uh, allocate money, but we don't get the desired outcomes from it. Uh, and we haven't put enough money mm -hmm. in infrastructure. See, because I think that if I look at the economies that attracted foreign directness and more than others, they also created jobs. Okay, because what uh, one phenomenon that has been really interesting to observe with the multinationals is that they will uh, acquire a local company and actually increase employment, sometimes manifold, because they don't keep the same people. They will often churn, you know, that. But they will deploy it into the worldwide chain that they have. So if a company that was producing just for the local market before will be producing for the world market. Yeah. So it's funny, China has too much investment, India has too little investment, <laughs> they're both saving at high rates. Uh, Leonard, do you want to raise a question? Yeah, and then David. Uh, mentioned that in the longer term, beyond the, first, the next 10 years, the power of the state will become a constraining factor in terms of next stage growth. Now, I also heard that in India, uh, you still have difficulty getting the right infrastructure. So I wonder whether these two, in China, I think if they want to have more infrastructure, there's no problem. They have too much of that. Whether the discrepancy, the differences, are related to the political system. 
democracy in India and the one party government in, in China. What do you think? Well, you know, there are between China and India similarities and differences. Uh, but if we go down, you know, to the basics, I think China's strength lies in its capacity and the capacity of its party and government to implement public action. The creation of infrastructure is just an example of that capacity to implement public action. Um, but the political system doesn't quite have the resilience or the strength to manage conflict and contradiction, which is bound to surface. Okay? India is the polar opposite. Huh? It has almost no capacity to implement public action. Uh, not because, you know, it's not as if all of India is the same. You look at the states of the Indian Union, they're very different. So there's good governance in some states and bad governance in the others. It's the sort of, you know, competitive politics of populism or a cynical politics of opportunism in democracy that sometimes drives you in, in bad directions. But it's also possible to be, to be good. But, but India's real strength is it has a capacity to manage conflict and contradiction. Its political system has developed that maturity. Governments may be unstable, but democracy is very stable. So in many ways, the questions I would, I would you know, this is a personal view. Uh, I would look, you know, in resolving China's long-term constraints, I would look much more at the political system, not at the economy. They have addressed many of their questions. Young has drawn attention to the fact that men, much of the workforce will have low levels of education and skill 10 years from now and could become a constraint. Uh, but in, in, in India, uh, I think we have to look at how to, to, to get better governance, more accountability that will deliver on the economy. Uh, but I would, long term, I would bet on India. I think it has a very, you know, it has strength and resilience that comes from political democracy. If you look at people writing about the United States, you look at Tocqueville, he wrote about the U.S. in 19, 1835, 1858. Uh, uh, or you read even Gore Vidal, Washington, D.C., 1876, 100 years after independence. Uh, India doesn't look very different from the United States around 1900. Uh, democracies evolve slowly. Uh, but at the end, I think democracy also delivers. The trouble is we no longer live in, in, in the late 19th, early 20th century. Uh, you know, austerity now for prosperity later is something people and excluded are not willing to accept. So somehow we have to put political systems into a drive which is much more responsive. That's an interesting perspective, especially given rising social conflicts in China. Uh, David. Yes, uh, thank you for providing so many interesting uh, insights. Uh, in some things, it seems like they're opening up a new paradigm for us to think. Uh, but as a global institute, I would like to seek your advice in terms of conceptualizing this whole topic. Uh, in particular, do we precede our conventional research with more policy makings and firm practices? Because many of the sharing is saying that the practice actually precede many of our conventional thought. And second, and we are talking about an like indigenous approach. I mean, do we go for first indigenous country by country before we generalize, or should we be doing something in parallel? Well, so I think you have several, several things there, right? But, but one thing I, I would say you're pointing out, which is good, is that one should not generalize at the expense of really understanding the specificities of individual countries or even regions and so on, because there are you know, differences which are, which are important. On the other hand, it seems to me that institutes such as this one, uh, you know, parts of its expertise, an important part should be to be able to abstract and take the important things that are common, or common at least in a region, if not globally, and then ask itself and provide answers as to how that would you know, best be uh, sort of uh, handled in terms of policy, be it at the national level, be it at some uh, more regional or global level. I think because a lot of the issues are now increasingly more global, okay? It's just uh, the world is more connected and so on, be it through technology, capital flows, 
the fact that uh, you don't have one third of the population hermetically sealed as it used to be, you know, communism, non-communism kind of divide. So I think that we have really a much more common ground that we have to understand and it's moving and it's changing very fast and that's I think where it is. The trick is, and you can actually look at individual actors, look at the entrepreneurs and you'll find a lot of similarities of the you know, entrepreneurs in Latin America here, uh, you know, Russia and so on. And I'm coming back, perhaps when I was, uh, you know, speaking about uh, um, a constraint being capital, it's the small entrepreneurs that feel the impact of the financial crisis the most. Because that's where the lending institutions have cut back and become much more cautious. So the engines of growth at the micro level have actually been affected dramatically in that particular respect. It's country specific in how it's manifested, but it's global in terms of observing the phenomenon. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, from my own uh, experience, uh, I would say uh, studying China can provide two benefits uh, for doing academic research in general. First, when you uh, study China, you probably are going to find some new things, a new phenomena. And then you can uh, generalize something, contribute to the theory. Uh, that's one. Uh, the other one is that uh, you see the world from the lens of East Asia. I think that's also very, very important. Okay, and that, that's actually very important. Uh, sometimes, you know, this is just a, a human nature. When you sit there, you speak from your own angle. And many of the opinions spoken by, say, American economists are just wrong. For example, the, this, uh, this savings card uh, said by uh, Blanky, that was just wrong. That's just a, a, a partner wrong, right? Uh, so uh, if we can speak uh, from the perspective uh, of uh, the savers, okay, then uh, we are going to provide kind of a correction to that wrong message. Yeah, I, I have just two sentences in response to what I think is an important question. Uh, first, I, I think that uh, mature industrial societies have an attribute which, which somehow institutionalized interaction between government, industry, academia, the world of science, and also almost built into the process. Whereas in emerging countries, partly because progress has been telescoped in time, we still tend to work in silos. Mm -hmm. uh, that there isn't enough connect. There may be the most wonderful scientific research, but it's not translated into marketable products because there's little connect with, with industry. Uh, there may be very good technological work on improving sanitation, delivering drinking water, but it's not combined with social science research on what kind of bot bottlenecks there are. That, that's one, and I think it'll take time, but rather than wait, we need to institutionalize mechanisms in a proactive way. The other thing, I agree with Young completely. You know, there are too many shibboleths that come from priors uh, that are part of some intellectual tradition or the other. We are not looking at experience enough, uh, particularly of late industrializers. Uh, and East Asia is not about the magic of markets. East Asia is about much more than that. Uh, so somehow if people begin to study what's happening in these societies, just as they have, they studied Europe, they studied the United States and try and sort of weave that into their models and intellectual tradition, I think we would make progress much more than we do. I think these comments are a very nice set of instructions or reflections on the mission of the Institute for Emerging Market Studies going forward and the collaborations that we'll be engaging in with uh, some of your institutions, some people represented here as well as many others. I'm under very strict orders to end this uh, session on time, so I'm going to have to close. I know there are a couple of other questions, uh, hands raised, but I'm going to close uh, our uh, opening launch event here and thank all of our participants.